Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Baba Batra Daf Kufchet. We're going to finish the seventh chapter, start the eighth chapter, the whole next section about laws of inheritance. So we have just a little bit to finish up. We talked about this, someone who says, I'm going to sell you a, oh, thank you for reminding me. Um, I'm going to sell you a half a field. And then we said, if you're going to sell the half a field, then you also have to, well, then there was a question, does the seller have to provide it or is it the buyer who specifically needs to be the one who's in charge of that? But there needs to be either which way we look at it, we're not sure. And that it obviously has different meaning either which way, whether one person has to provide it or the other. But the point is that around the field, there's going to be a fence. Beyond the fence is a charit, is a ben charit, is a, actually we're going to see right, right now. Yeah, the charit, the ben charit is the, Excuse me. <coughs> the narrower one, and then there's going to be a wider ditch. So these are all dug around the the property. What's the purpose of doing this around the field? To which we answered at the top of our daf. Now we're starting kadesh alote chayakofetzim. We don't want any animals to jump in. So instead of having to make the the fence very high, you dig a ditch and that prevents it. So now the obvious question is, so just make one big ditch, six fachim wide. Notice it doesn't talk about the depth at all, which is interesting. But do six fachim wide, and then you won't have to do the ben charitz. And what do you need the narrower one for? I did ravach kaime begabe bekafza. They say, well, if it's so wide, like six fachim, then the animal can actually go sit comfortably in that ditch area. And jump from there, again, because I said they didn't really mention the depth, it might be a little deeper, but still it gives the animal enough ability to jump from there. So then they say, and then what's the issue? Well, the issue is you put another karitz before that, which is going to, right, which is narrow, and the animal can't really go into that one, and then the other one's distance, so you won't be able to get there. Well, if you dig this wide ditch, you're worried the animal will stand in there, so why don't you just dig a narrow ditch, and then not so wide, and then you don't have to worry about the animal standing comfortably in the ditch because they can't, and jumping. Well, the obvious issue is I did cutting. Kaima sifte bekafza. We're worried that the, since it's so narrow, the animal actually could stand on top of there. So what do you do? You have both. If you have, right, you can't stand on the edge of the narrow ditch if right next to it is a, another ditch. So therefore, you have both ditches. And now you see why, because there's only a tefach in between both those ditches, and that will not allow the animal enough place to stand on the on the banks of the of the ditch. But it could, right, and if it does stand inside the farther away ditch, well, it's already farther away, and you don't have to worry, it's not going to be able to jump because both because it's deeper and because it's farther away. And with that, Hadron Alach Beit Kor, we finished our chapter and finished this whole section we've been dealing with for a few chapters already about selling items, what's included, what's not. And now we're going to move on to the next chapter. Yesh no chalim manchilim, yesh no chalim velo manchilim, manchilim velo no chalim, lo no chalim velo manchilim. Okay, that's a mouthful. And it's a very typical structure of a Mishnah where the Mishnah delineates all the possibilities. There's it could happen like this, it could happen like that, it could, right? There's all four possibilities. And sometimes when they do this, and particularly in our case, there's going to be a lot of repetition. Okay, and you'll see why very soon. Nochalin, let's get the lingo. Nochalin and manchilin. Nochalin means inherit, meaning there are these, you now we're talking about relationships here. This person to this person. So if we take these two people and we look at the relationship between them, Sometimes we have people who are in category one, where if one dies, they pass on inheritance to the other, and if the other dies, they pass on inheritance to the other. So that is called no chalim, which is we're looking at one person in that relationship with somebody else, and we're saying that person could be both no chel, they inherit if the other person dies, and if they die, then they pass on their inheritance to the other person. So it means it goes in both directions. Now, yesh no chalin velo manchilin. There's people who inherit, but do not, thank you, Ruth, bequeath their property to other people, right? So they would inherit from them, but they do not have the kind of relationship with that particular person that they bequeath to them. 
Manchilim velo nanchilim, this is the reverse. They bequeath, but they don't inherit. And lo nochalim velo manchilim, there are some who do neither. And now, as the Mishnah likes to do with this kind of structure, they set up what the four categories are, and now we're going to go in depth into each one. Elu nonchalim umanchilim. These are the people who it goes in both directions. Ha'av et habanim, a father to the sons. Okay, because what will happen? Now, what does this mean? Nochalim means if the father, if the son dies, the father will inherit from the son. Okay, we're going to get the first case, just so you, you're very clear on this. The first case is nochalim ha'av et habanim, which means a father inherits his son. The Gemara is going to ask, um, is going to ask, why do we start with this case? Okay, now, Gita, you're pointing out something important, and the Mishnah doesn't actually get to it yet. Gita writes in the in the chat that it's only if the son has no sons. Now, the Mishnah is not discussing the order of who gets first. That's going to be our, our first, one of the first things we're going to do when we get to the Gemara is, what's the order of inheritance? Right now, the only thing that concerns the Mishnah is, who could potentially inherit from someone else, assuming that there are in children, for example, or whatever it might be. So that's important to, to distinguish between those two things. One is what's the order, and the other is who is potentially on the list. They could be 10th on the list, but they're on the list. Okay, so that's the issue here that the mission is discussing. So the first question the is going to ask is why we, we start with such a terrible situation of a son dying and leaving inheritance to the father. Why don't we start with the basic case of the basic case of inheritance, the way it comes up in the Torah is it first goes to your children, which means a father dies and passes on to the children, not the son to the father. But anyway, we'll get to that in the Gemara. Achim mina av. So this means, I'm sorry, av mina av So this means, number one, no chalim. So again, if son dies, father will inherit. And if the father dies, then it goes the other way, right? And I'm sorry, um, right, man chilim. That the father can bequeath his inheritance to his sons. That's obvious. Habanim et av. Okay, this is funny. This is the exact reverse of what we just said. And it's obvious based on what we just said. If a father to the son is no chalim and man chilim, then a son to the father is no chalim and man chilim. What this basically means is it's just coming from who's the subject here. Is it the father? Is it the son? But if the father dies, right, the son is no chel, the son inherits. And if the son dies, the son bequeaths. So, it's a total repeat. Why are they mentioning it? They're probably mentioning it because they want to give all the cases of, of a person and with some other relative and what, you know, that they can be both manchil and nochil, which makes sense then that it would have to be repeated because one goes in one direction, one goes in the other. The third case doesn't need repetition because it's hachim and av. This is brothers to each other. So we're talking about brothers to brothers. You don't even say, and brothers to brothers, right? And brother A to brother B and brother B to brother A. It's obvious that it goes in both directions. These are all brothers from the father. If brothers share the same father, this is going to remind you of Yibum, and the diagram I'm going to show you the picture will also remind you of Yibum, because um, it's all about fam family relationships. Fathers from the uh, sons, sorry, brothers who share the same father inherit from each other and do Yibum for each other. Yibum and inheritance is all connected because when you do Yibum and marry your brother's widow, you also inherit your brother's property. It's all connected. But that's only done through the father. So if you have brothers from the father, a brother theoretically, again, there's some other people in line first, but could both inherit from his brother and pass on inheritance to his brother, bequeath to the brother. Okay, that's case category one. Now we're going to move to category two. Haish et imo, a man to his mother. So again, what does this mean? If the mother dies, the the father, uh, the father, son is your resh, inherits. Again, could inherit. If the son dies, the mother does not inherit the son. Ha'isha dishto, husband and wife. So a husband to his wife. So again, now all this category, I didn't say the words inside. Nochel velo manchil. So a husband inherits his wife's property when she dies. And that's why I said the son, right, will get it only after the husband. The husband comes first, if not the son. But if husband dies, the wife does not inherit the husband's property. And b'nei achayot. 
What are Bnei Achayot? These are nephews through the mother. Okay, what does that mean? I'm going to show you in the picture. Um, no, that's not the one I meant to share. Let's try this again. Um, here. Okay. So in my diagram, I took Avraham, okay, and, and Nahor, who is his brother. I took Yitzchak as the one who dies, Avraham's son. He dies. He has a brother, Yishmael, and he has a sister, Devorah. Let's just say I made it up. But that, she's the one that's important for our purposes. So we have Devorah here, okay? If Yitzchak, so now what do we have here? B'nai Achayot. So this means Devorah's son, so that would be Yitzchak. Yitzchak is the deceased. His nephew through his sister. So how does this work? What this means is if Yitzchak were to die, theoretically, it could go to his sister. And from his sister, if his sister's not alive anymore, it'll go to the nephew, David. So David could, Nochel, inherit. He's the Ben Achot, the son of the sister, of the deceased. So he's the nephew. It's very simple. It's just the nephew through the mother. So he's the nephew. He could inherit. But Yitzchak will never inherit David, and that's very clear why. Because the nephew, in order for the uncle through the mother to inherit from the nephew, it would have to go through the mother, right? In other words, what would have to happen was, theoretically, we would say the mother inherits from the son. And then from there, let's say she's not alive, then it'll go to her brother. But a mothers don't inherit from the sons, we just said that. So, therefore, the Bnei Chayot goes in that only one direction. So, very simply said, the nephew inherits from the uncle through his mother, but isn't Manchil, but he doesn't pass on inheritance to the uncle. If, let's say, he were to die, it wouldn't go to his uncle. Okay, next case. Now, the next category is very simple because we just said that this category is Nochel Vela Manchil, and now we're going to talk about relationships that are Manchil and not Nochel, the reverse. So we're basically going to take those three cases we just saw and talk about the opposite person in the relationship. It's the same thing as we had the av at habanim and banim at ha'av, where it was the flip, one of the other. Same thing here. It's just there, it was both manchil and ochil, and therefore it went in both directions. Here we're going to have those worked in one direction, not the other, and these work in the other direction. So you'll see in a minute. Ha'isha et baneha, a woman and her sons. Now that's the reverse of ha'isha timo. Isha timo, we said, right, the, the man can inherit his mother, but his mother doesn't bequeath to him. So Ishai Baneha is the mother, right, and is Manchil. She passes on her inheritance to the sons, but not Nochil. So she bequeaths, but she doesn't inherit. And that's the same as Isha Dimo. A man to his mother is the same as a mother to her son. It's the exact same relationship. Ha'ishai Ba'ala and Ha'isha Tishto, a man to his wife, is the flip of a woman to her husband. So a woman to her husband bequeaths her property to her husband, but she doesn't inherit from her husband. And ache ha'im, and the brother through the mother, which is the uncle. So again, the uncle passes, bequeaths inheritance to, bequeaths to the nephew, but doesn't inherit from the nephew. So that's very easy. The Gemara is going to later ask, we haven't gotten to it, we'll get to it in a few days, why does it repeat this? And now it's obvious why it repeats it because the Mishnah wants to set up all four categories and the Mishnah in general repeats. But the Gemara is going to come up with a different reason as to why it repeated it that it wants to teach you something else. That's what the Gemara is going to claim. Okay. Last category, last line of the Mishnah. Brothers through the mother are not at all connected where it comes to loss of inheritance. They do not inherit one from the other at all. Okay, they don't bequeath, they don't inherit. It's as if they're not related for purposes of inheritance. And that, see, also comes from Mishpachotam, Lebet Avotam. It's all about the Mishpacha of the father. Father, all the inheritance goes through the father. Again, some of it sometimes goes through the mother, but mainly we deal with it by the father and not the mother. So now the Gemara asks our question, which I mentioned they were going to ask. Say, why did it bring... The first case being the son dies and basically, you know, the son dies and the inheritance goes to and bequeaths his inheritance to his father. And now the Gemara is not just going to ask that question, but tell us why they're perplexed by this. They're perplexed by this for two reasons. Number one, chada, right? This is unfortunately something we 
are dealing with in the news daily that this is happening, that sons are, uh, fathers are burying or m fathers and mothers are burying their children. Um, it's terrible. Why would we want to start with a terrible, tragic, devastating situation? Why don't we just start with a basic situation that an elderly person dies and leaves their inheritance to their sons? That's the natural way of events. So why do we read it like, why did the Mishnah start off with a depressing case? And now turning to Amabet, you'll see it's a very short daf. Ve'od, and furthermore, kedichtiv, ish kiamut uben enlo. The first case in the Torah that it discusses inheritance and illicit, and well, not exactly the first case, but we'll say, when I'm, I'm going to read it right now and you'll see right away, the first order of business in, in inheritance is a father. And this is Gita, you pointed this out right away, which is, while it's true that a son, that a father can inherit from a son, it's only if the son has no children. But the basic case is, First, somebody dies, and their first go-to is their son. So why wouldn't it give that case first? It's the most basic case in the Torah that they talk about. Now let's read the Psuki, because this is going to be important to set up both for the rest of today's class and for I keep sharing the wrong screen, and for what we are um, what we're going to see in the continuation. So these are very important Psukim. You have to. This is what we call careful reading because careful reading notices not only what's there, but what's missing. Okay, so if you remember, the whole issue of inheritance in the Torah comes up in Bamibar chapter 27, and it comes up with the daughters of Tzlofchat. They basically complain, our father has no sons, and what are we supposed to do? What's supposed to happen with his nachala? We want to inherit. So in the end, right, Moshe doesn't know what to do. He goes to God. It's one of the four cases in the Torah. Moshe turns to God and says, what's the halacha? God says, right, they're right, give them nachala and and pass the nachala of their father to them. Later, not today, we're going to darshan this word. It says it here, havarta, we're going to actually use it later, where it says havartem. Specifically, when it comes to a daughter, there's a weird language. In all the other places, it says nitatem, you give the nachala. And specifically by a daughter, it says you pass on the nachala. It's a bit of a weird it's strange that only by her it uses a different language, a verb, a different verb, but that's not for today. So now, after God settles that, he says, El B'nai Yisrael to Daber Limor. Now I want you to tell the Jewish people, here is the order of inheritance. Now that's the first, that's what we just quoted. And that's the first thing God tells the people. If a person is to die and doesn't have a son, which means... Son is the most basic case, and it's also in order of precedent. And that's why the Gemara is saying, why didn't it start with this case? This is the basic case the Torah started with. You would assume the Mishnah would start with the way the Torah started. And that's the question. And we stopped in the Gemara right now. We left the question aside. We're going to get back to it in a moment. I just want to read the Psukim first and point out something that's blatantly missing in the Torah and go through the order. So a person dies, doesn't have a son. So you pass on the inheritance to the daughter. So if there's no sons, it goes to the daughter. So if we go in order, first sons, if no sons, then daughter, right? The order is always going to be based on if you don't have or if they're already dead. Okay, later we'll get to what if the son's dead but has children. That's, that, that's not in the Torah here, and we'll deal with that later. It's also not in our Mishnah. It's not in the Gemara. So each in its own time. So a person dies and doesn't have a son, it goes to the daughter. Now, what if he doesn't have a daughter? So he doesn't have a son, he doesn't have a daughter. It goes to his brother. And if he doesn't have a brother, Okay, so now it goes, right? So let's take Yitzchak. If Yitzchak dies here, number one, it'll go to Yaakov. If Yaakov, there's no Yaakov or he's dead, it'll go to Yael. Okay, that's I made up a name for a sister. It would go to Yael. If it doesn't go to Yael, it will go to Yishmael, Yitzchak's brother. And if it doesn't go to Yishmael, it will go to Yitzchak's uncle, Nahor, his brother's, his father's brother. Now, who is obviously missing here? The father, Abraham. How could you give it to the uncle before you give it to the brother, uh, the father? In other words, the uncle's brother, right? Yitzchak, if Yitzchak dies and it goes to Nahor, wouldn't it go to Abraham first? So Abraham is blatantly missing from this text, okay? The father of the deceased. So again, son, daughter, brother, uncle. 
And then it says, Vim ein achim aviv. What if there's no uncle? Okay, you've gone through your whole list again, other than the father who isn't just totally missing here. But you've gone through your whole list. You've gone to the uncle. There's no uncle. Okay, what do you do? You give it to the next of kin, basically, is what the simple reading of this pasuk is. Sheiro is your relative. Hakarov elav, who's close to you from your family. It sounds like whoever comes closest to, right, you probably go up a generation to the grandfather and their siblings and, the, you know, their kids. Okay. What about the father? Where's the father? So comes the Gemara and says the following. Okay, now they're not answering the question yet about the father, but in their answer is really, in what they say is really the answer. The Gemara says, Tana Aide, so again, why did we start, I got you a little sidetracked. The question is, why did we start with the case where the son dies and it goes to the father, which is actually the case that's missing in the Torah, okay? Besides it not being the basic case, besides it being a depressing case, it's also not even mentioned in the Torah. The Gemara doesn't say that, but that's going to be the lead into the answer. Well, the answer is, Ah, we've seen this argument before. Because we don't even know from the Torah that a father inherits from the son, so we learn it out of a drasha. And because we learn it from a drasha, it's much more beloved among, to the rabbis. The rabbis love things that are learned out by drasha, and therefore they put it first because it's a unique situation, because it doesn't say so explicitly in the Torah. Okay, my drasha, what's the drasha? Ditanya, she'ero ze'ha'av. Okay, we're going to deal a lot with this drasha, also in the next half. The she'el, in that last pasuk, and this is a bit of a strange drasha again, because if you already saw my chart, my picture, you saw that the father actually comes third. Okay, now, before the brothers. What they're going to say is this last pasuk, which the simple reading is, this is the last in the list, right? If there's no uncle, then you give it to the Sheiro HaKarovela. Who's the Sheiro? The father, which sounds like the father would be number five, not number three, okay? Right, that's how I put the list here. The son, the daughter, the brother, the uncle, and then the Sheiro HaKarovela. But they're gonna say the Sheir is the Av. Milamed Sha'av Kodem La'achim, and the Drasha says, the Av is number three, put in between the daughter and the brother. Okay, and that's why I put it in the picture here, that Avraham would be third. As soon as you turns out you have no children, it goes right to the father. And that's what they learn from here, even though that pasuk that they darshan it from is actually talking about number five, not number three, but they say it belongs earlier. Yechol yehei kodem leben. Now, instead of saying, why isn't it at the end, they actually say the other question, right? Everyone knows it's not going to be after the the um, the uncle, because it makes no sense that Avram would come before Nahor. Uh, Yitzchak is obviously much more related to Avram than he is to Nahor. Maybe you could say the brothers, but they say here, why don't maybe a father is even closer than his sons? Right? In, in theory, right? Yitzchak's relationship to Avram and Yitzchak's relationship to his own sons, right? They're all father-son relationships. So maybe the father should have gone first. Tamud Lomar Hakarov. So they darshan from this pasuk, Sheiro Hakarov Elav. The She'er is the father. The Karov Elav says, Oh, but the one who's a closer relative comes first. And who's this closest relative to the deceased? Actually, his own son is closer than his father. So now they say, Umara Ita. Okay, they're raising a lot of questions here. Mara Ita le Rabotet Ben Ta'ach. Why is a son? Okay, we're basically saying the son is definitely closer than the father. But perhaps the brother is also closer than the father. In other words, why did you put the father in between the son and daughter and the brother? Why don't you put the brother first and then the father? Like I said, it's pretty clear that the father is not going to come before the uncle. But maybe the father should come after the brother. Okay. Um, did I say it right? It's clear the father will come before the uncle, but it's not so clear the father will come before the brother, and that's the question they're raising now. So they say, right, why is this, and they're saying, theoretically, why is a son closer than a brother? Theoretically, right, a brother also has a certain closeness that you could argue. So what do they answer? There's two halachot where a son takes the place of the father. 
and a brother doesn't. Okay, what are these two alachot? So I brought the psukim on your sheet, as soon as you go scroll past the picture. The first is yeud. Yeud is, what happens is if a man, okay, this is hard for us to imagine, but they used to buy slaves, what does it mean? It means, right, we're talking about Jewish slaves. A, a man can't afford to support his daughter, so he sells her off to be a slave. And what he's really doing is she's young, she's under under the age of maturity, and when she gets to maturity, what the owner can do is can basically marry her. And he doesn't even need to give Kesef Kiddushin because the money he purchased her with functions as the Kesef Kiddushin. And he can do that for himself. And the Pasuk says in, cha- in Shemot chapter 21, verse 9, V'im libno adena, and if he decides to give her instead to his son, Okay, he has to treat her like he would treat any wife. But the main point being that a son can also, and it's, he can't say, oh, I bought her as a slave. I'll just marry her off to my neighbor. Can't do that. Can't marry her off to his brother. But he can marry her off to his son. And that shows that a son can be in place of the father. That's explicitly in the Torah. The next one is not explicitly in the Torah, but it's based on a Torah law. So the Torah law about a stech who's is the following. A sechuza, we've talked about this, it's an ancestral field. Now, theoretically, you, what happens with an ancestral field, it goes back in the Jubilee year. And you can also consecrate it if you want to the temple. And what do you do? If you do, it's got this, remember the zera, chomer, sorim, b'chamishim, shekel, kesef, it's the 50 shekels amount for a core, um, for 30 se'a, and depending on how many years left to the Jubilee year, because basically in the Jubilee year, it goes back to the original owner. But what happens? So I sanctified this field, consecrated it. I now have to pay the value of it to the temple. If I do, I've redeemed the field because now whatever I consecrated is now moved to the money and I can now use my field. But if I don't do that, I theoretically can sell it to someone else and they can do it. So, im lo lo od. If I sold the field to someone else, I can no longer redeem it. And the Sadeh becomes Kodesh Lashem, Basically, it ends up going to the Kohanim. So if I allow someone else to redeem the field or I sell it to someone else and I don't redeem it myself, then it goes to the Kohanim in the Jubilee year. If I redeem it myself, it becomes back to my property. So now, what's the issue? The issue is, the, the, there's a drasha that teaches that a son... If a son redeems it instead of the father, it's as if the father redeemed it. And then it remains in the family property, it remains in the father's possession, and it doesn't go to the Kohanim in the Jubilee year. So what, because it says, and they say, what's Adam Acher? Someone outside the family. What does it mean to be outside the family? Just not the son. Meaning, if it were the brother who did it, it would count as somebody else. But if it's the son, it's the same person. So what do you see here? Son is like the father. And that's why it was clear. And this is just analyzing the strasha. Why was it clear that the karov, karov elav, is the son, and that the son clearly comes before the father, but not the brothers? Because the, the son is much closer to his father than a brother is to his brother, by Torah law, because of these two things. To which the Gemara says, what are you talking about? You're pulling out Torah, I'll pull out Torah. Ad Rabba, marbani shekein kam tachad achiv liyibum. If a man dies without children, comes the brother, marries his wife, inherits his property, and basically takes the role of his brother. What's that if not replacing the brother, right? You have a great example here of someone coming in place of someone else. So wouldn't you think then that would make the brother very close? So what are the answer, right? They say, okay, you're arguing which is closer, brother or son? Well, when does Yibum happen that the brother takes the place of his brother? Only when the brother has no son or children. So what does that show? That shows that the children are obviously closer than the brother. It's true the brother replaces his brother if the brother had no sons. But if he had sons, the sons are obviously more important. You don't even need Yibum then. So from there you prove the son is more important. So now we're good. We've proven the son is closer to his father. That's why the son comes first. Then we have the father and then the brothers. Okay? And the father, Joshua, comes in. Again, we got to there because She'ero. She'ero must be father. We take it out of the simple reading that 
He's the last on the list. No, he's not. We're going to move him up earlier, but we're not going to move him too early because it said Shehra Karov. And the word Karov came to say whoever's the closest, though, goes first, and that's the son and the daughter. And only after that will the father come, but not the brother because the brother, even though the brother is has Yibum, but that's only when there's no son. And the son comes in place of the father in Yehud and Steh Achuza. To which the Gemara asks, wait a minute, sounds like the reason we knocked out the brother was because we thought Yibu makes the brother closer, but it's only when there's no son, and because of that we knocked the brother out and put him lower on the list. But but let's say you didn't have that argument about the the son, um, the the there's no Yibu right unless there's there's only Yibu when there's no son. Have, you would have thought the brother's first. It's pretty obvious the brother's not first because it's a numbers game. You could say, wait, Yibum, that was very nice. You tried to prove against Steh, Huzah, and Yehud from Yibum. But Yibum is one way the Torah says they're together. And Steh, Huzah, and, and Yehud is two ways that the son takes the place of the father. So if the son takes the place of the father in two instances, you would think that would be a strong enough argument to say, Son will go before brother. You wouldn't need this argument of, oh, let's knock out Yibum because Yibum only happens when there's no son. You could have said, knock out Yibum because it's two against one. And that's where we're left with now. You'll have to wait till tomorrow's stop to see what the answer to that question is. And we're going to raise a lot of questions about this drasha. Who's to say the father is in number three? Maybe the father should be in place number four. Maybe the father should be, and they're going to play around with this whole drasha. Um, we'll get to that in tomorrow's stop. So what we did today, very simply, pretty short daf, we talked about the charitz and the ben charitz and what the purpose is. And then we moved on to the new chapter and talked about the four categories of people who either inherit and bequeath, inherit or bequeath, bequeath or inherit, or neither. Okay, and we went through all those relationships of people and what, who does what to who. But we didn't talk about order at all. And order only comes up, I would say, as we say, derech agav, like because we asked this question, about, I mean, they would have gotten to it anyway. But because we asked this question, why did we start with the case of a son who dies and bequeaths to his father? Why did we start with a simple case of a father who bequeaths to the son? To which we answer, well, the whole thing that a father inherits is all learned from a drasha. It does not appear in the psukim. If they don't address why it doesn't appear explicitly in the psukim. But it doesn't appear because the drasha came first, and then we learned the drasha, and then we started asking questions on the drasha and started trying to figure out why exactly the father goes in that place and why the brothers don't come before the son in inheritance. Like that wasn't even relating to the father. That was really the brothers to the son. Why was it obvious that the, the one who's going to go first is clearly the son? Why was that obvious? And it's not the brothers. Okay. Now, I mean, also the Torah says that the, the, that the, um, I just want to see one thing. Mario and the robot it had been, see, it's a, I want to check one thing. Rabbi Taben. Yeah, I mean, obviously the best son comes first because the Torah says the son comes first. But I guess what they meant here is, lo ta'ach, you know, why is the ach going to come after the father? I guess that's really what they're addressing and not why does the ach come, you know, but the, the karov that they're saying that the father, that comes before the father is the son and not the brother. That's really what we're addressing. Nobody really thinks the brother should come before the son in the order of, because it's clear from the Torah. But what they're saying is when they learn that word karov, to exclude the father, the father comes after the karov, maybe it's the brother. With that, we'll finish for today. And wishing everyone a gemar chatima tova, shabbat shalom, a, a good fast and calm holiday. And shenishma b'sorot tovot.